He didn't think he was that great, but we did. He got that ill voice, and then you pay attention to what he's saying. It's like you know he got some kind of knowledge himself. Every time we see him, he's dead fly. Waves are spinning. He's pushing something crazy. You know, I just feel like he created a lane for himself. He didn't want to go where anybody else, where I went, where this guy went. And to still be standing now and to have not compromised his artistry, I think says it all. At times, I went to watch out the Mabiot, zoning on owning co-ops, horns, drop top, coops and yachts. 20 years ago, AZ made hip hop history with his revolutionary debut album, Do or Die. The album was an instant classic and quickly soared to number one. Each track showcased his signature tone and verses so potent they blazed new trails into the new millennium. Turn your speakers up as we go on a nostalgic journey back to where it all began, Brooklyn. I'm Rock Kim, and this is 20 Years Later, Do or Die. Rock the house, rock the house. Rock. I'm bad that you need. Climate in East New York. When we moved there, Anthony was nine. He had a few challenges because the kids out there was a little rougher than the kids in Crown Heights. My aunt lived out here, and I guess that was what made my moms want to come out here, you know, because my mom's a single mother. Uh, you know, she wanted to come somewhere affordable. Growing up without a father was tough. It was a given. You're the, you're the boy of the house, you're the man of the house, so you have to take charge. Making sure my mom's was all right, like I'm the only male in the house, it was my mom's and my sister, and just making sure they was good was like the biggest thing in my life. When he turned nine, he had to learn how to ride the train to school, because I left him in school in Crown Heights. Yeah, it was a better school, so he had to ride the train by himself at nine. You know, I had to still travel to the schools. My mom didn't want to switch me out to school. I was fairly new over here, you know what I mean? It was different energy. It was like the survival of the fittest, you know? And I'm really young, but I'm, I'm hearing the noise, I'm seeing the action. That was the beginning of everything. Because growing up in East New York was no skipping a park. So it wasn't fancy or glamorous at all. What up, God? OK, OK. I ain't going nowhere. Guarantee. That's my, that's my word. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that time when he turned 12, he started writing music. You know, he started writing, he had this book and he's writing all these things. I always was attracted to poetry from school with Langston Hughes and, and things like that. And I used to always write, you know, I, I wrote, you know, little raps. Me and my brother shared a room for the majority of our life. So our room was his lab. You know, she used to see, hear me spit some of the poetry and she was like, I could see she was amazed and just like, okay, he sounded pretty fair to compare what's on TV or what you hear on the radio, you know? I would see him writing and rhyming, and I didn't really understand at first. I was like, oh, so you're aspiring to be a rapper, okay. I think I had the soul since then. I, I acquired the, the interest in wanting to rap then. From there, I just started, you know, writing rhymes and saying rhymes to myself, and, you know, nobody really knew, kept it to myself. But before the fame, he was just a regular kid writing verses and spitting rhymes. The neighborhood was a stage and could be a safe haven during the day, but deadly by sundown. This was always the case in Dead Man's Park. You know, we always had block parties. Everybody had block parties, but a park jam was something different. Usually on a block party, the people from the block participate. But when you have a park jam, everybody in the community come, and that's when, you know, we had our 40s, and private stock and pina colada and mixing them. You know, I'm young. Everybody was just in their zone. Like, you know, the real gangsters, the fake gangsters, the baby gangsters, everybody was just there. The ladies was out. Just me looking right now, it's like I, 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 could, I could see the picture in my brain how it was. You know, there'll be nobody in the park. And like, you know, once you turn the music on, you know, it starts with 100, but we might end up with 500 people out there in the next two, three hours. It's called Dead Man Park. There was always a body in here which is not a good thing, but that's what it was, you know what I mean? But I remember when Sessa Sonic and them was out here, and we had, a, we had a, a, a park jam here, and they tore the shit down. They tore it down. AZ's interaction with us was always amazement, and just noticing that it was us doing it, 
and it wasn't somebody from another neighborhood. It wasn't somebody from the Bronx. It was that these dudes are actually doing it. And Daddy O, you know, is, is one of my homies, and I saw them get busy, and I was like, wow. You know, I seen the reaction from the crowd, and I was like, I could do that. You know what I mean? In my mind, I could do that. I like that. I like the reaction. I like what they was doing. Crowd control. That's when the music hit me. The beginning of your documentary, you know what I'm saying? We're going to sell this. <sighs> We're going to sell this to the world when you become multi platinum. In the 80s, everybody had radios, and they walked the streets with the radios, and you hear it, and that's when it first connected me. I'm like, wow, you know, the beats, the lyrics, and they talking that language that I can relate to. I can remember when we used to have sessions, ciphers in the house, after we do a, we finish recording a demo or whatever, and then we'll critically analyze who had the hottest verse, who verse was whack or could use a little tightening up. And we were checking again, and we were, this is how we kept our sword sharp. I, I met him in, in, in Brooklyn, East New York, at the corner. I, mean, I was getting ready to use the, the phone booth to call him, but before I got there, I remember him saying, yo, son, there's a phone booth at the corner. Don't use that phone booth. They be sniping, dude. So you got to go around the corner to somewhere. I guess it was a supermarket or something. Call me from there, and I'll meet you outside in seven minutes. So we did that. And when I got in the car, the first rhyme I, I ever heard him say was, Get this, no one could get with this, so don't this, this, just witness this, live assist. But real, the skills are still, it's definitely ill, making MCs feel the fire like Stephanie Mills. And he just kept going on and on, and I was like, yo, this kid's crazy. With Pete Rock and AZ, it was a five-year process before you even heard him on Life's a Bitch. Park jams, boom boxes, the ciphers on the street corners defined the era. While developing his craft with my man Pete Rock, Yami, a mutual friend from Queens, he brought Nas and AZ together because he knew the unique perspective on their life would entertain and elevate the music as well. You know a song I'm talking about, Life's a Bitch and Then You Die. Here's what Nas recounts. Life's a Bitch came about um, because I had my eyes on up and coming rap dudes and that's what I wanted on my record. I didn't want anybody famous on it. He kept coming up in my head. He kept coming up in my head. I liked his style. And a friend of mine got locked up, and he was the one I wanted on my record. And I'm like, man, what do I do? And A, I remember A. So I called A to the studio. I just had him say rhymes for me. They were crazy, but none of them were just that right fit for the song. I was starting to think, man, this ain't gonna happen. Then he finally said this one rhyme. And it was like the skies just opened up. Visualizing the realism of life and actuality. Who's the baddest? The person status depends on salary. And my mentality is money orientated. As soon as I heard, visualizing the realism of my life and actuality. Who's the baddest? The person status depends on salary. Oh my. <laughs> Crazy. Crack. Nas had to go back and rewrite his verse. Fact. You know, when we heard that record, he got that ill voice, and then you pay attention to what he's saying, it's like you know he got some kind of knowledge himself. So automatically, for all the, you know, the street cats and, you know, the brothers that had knowledge himself was able to cheer him on and root for him and say, yo, that's, you hear what he's saying? In regards to forecasting the future of an artist, after just hearing that one record, you already like, he's getting a record deal. I'm invited to a record release party for a guy named Nas, who I knew very little about. And I'm there, and I hear this song, and I say, wow, that guy's really talented. And, they, and the guy next to me says, that's not Nas. I said, well, who did that line? And they said, that was a guy named AZ. So I said to the guy next to me, I want to meet AZ. Something about the verse got me. To me, I always wanted to run the best record company with artists that were authentic. He was a real artist. So uh, I got very excited when I got to know him. For him to get the best shot at having his own identity, he needed to, to be that rapper like Nas is at Sony. So we decided to go with EMI. They gave us the most promise with the money. In the spring of 1995, we started recording Do or Die in Electric Lady Studio. They just had a 
nice energy in there. Once I went in that studio, I was like, this is where I'm, I'm doing this album at right here. Electric Lady was my home. Newly signed and hot off the Illmatic tour, AZ stepped off the stage and into Jimi Hendrix Electric Lady studio. The birthplace of Do or Die. Icons like Run DMC, Bowie, and Prince left their mark and permission for genius to thrive. If their permissions was an inch, AZ took a mile. My whole direction once I got the record deal was I got to represent now, you know? My calling is here, you know, the time is here. That window of opportunity is open. I have to, you know, represent for Brooklyn. I was pretty hands off in the making of the records. And uh, I think what I told the team, I remember this pretty well, is let's stay out of the artist's way. Just be a facilitator. Just get him who he needs and who he wants. And I think, I know we wanted Pete Rock, Premier. I, I know the LES name had come up. And I said, let's make him happy. First song that set the album off was rather unique. Because Pete played a couple of beats and that, that particular um, song was in the mold and the vibration of the way the sound of hip hop was going at the time. And my whole thing is how I got on was unique, you know? With no expectations, just being at the right place, right time. Well, I have a funny story about Rather Unique. I had just made the beat. It was it was done, ready to lay it down in the studio with A. And there's an assistant engineer who was, you know, who's pretty busy running around the room doing things. And he was by the patch board where I kept my drum machine. And um, he made a mistake and was plugging stuff in and plugging my drum machine out with the beat, you know. And I'm like, oh man, so I had to do it all over again. My caliber got me thinking on a higher algebra. See me, I'm just a stylish, but you ain't got no style yeah. When the album started coming and surfacing, it was time to submit beats. So A came down to the studio. What was crazy was that every joint I was playing, he'll be like, yo, that's too hard. Give me something a little softer. And I'm like, oh man, you know, because mind you, I'm banging the IMOP all day, so I'm in straight hardcore mode, rugged mode. But as the track started playing, I said, hold on, let me try these joints, because these joints I ain't never really played for no one. And A heard the joints, he just started grabbing them. I was like, oh, this is the sound he won. And then when he got on that more money, more murder joint, that's the one where he stopped and said, yeah, I'm gonna take this back and see what my people's think. And he said, I'm gonna play this for Nas. You know, DR, period, he had that street sound. And he played the more money, more murder track. And I think it was a sample from the OJs. Man. And, and you know, Life's a Bitch was from Yearning For My Love. And it was, it was just oldies but goodies that touched the souls, that soul music. Oh man, we just, that just captivated everything. We just got into a zone with that. I just wanted to make something hard. You know, the chorus gotta be hard, like how some of the verses are. More money, more motor, more homicide. Catch that body, you better have that alibi. You know, you better have something like, it was tell, It was like, you know, if you're gonna be out here and you're living that life, you better know how to live that life. AZ knew how to spit it and, and talk about that life and from like, like a, a book author. You know, like, he was that well written. Whoever thought of that sweet thing, born model material, that hated how silly yo could grow to be a hot silly ho, really though. We've been working with him, it's like he's picky as hell, and it's like just looking and, and sifting through maybe about a good eight, nine B tapes. When he found that one, he was like, yo, all right, I got one. This is this is the one right here. It's, it's the craziest song. It's like, y'all got the craziest story to your record. You know, he penned it, we went into Electric Lady, we did a couple of sessions, and we knocked it out. To make an album, you, you gotta have cohesiveness, and that was a melodic track within itself too, but it also was giving me a chance to get my storytelling on from a different perspective. Instead of just, you know, the streets and just being braggadocious on certain songs, it was, uh, you know, my interaction with female perspective or how I seen it. That was a good look. Buck came through with that. Sugar Hill was one of those songs that smoothed out the gentlemen and made the ladies pop their hips.
My DJ at the time was LES, and he told me that he had this new guy coming up, and they had this hot song, and they needed a girl to sing the hook, and they actually had someone singing already, Monifa, and they, I guess, didn't like it. So I came in, and then LES brought me to Nas, and Nas and LES sat me down. I remember it was three nights, the record company sent a car for me to go, and I didn't get in the car, and then the last night I was like, what do I have to lose? And it wound up being the biggest song of my career. We went through a lot of, a lot of females came with an audition and, and sung on, on the track, but Miss Jones came to the studio, and she did it, it was like, oh, that's it. That's, that's, that's the track. That's the one that set the album off. It was just crazy. I remember my dressing room was on the top. Watch your step, watch your step, watch your step. The dressing room right here had about 20, 20 homies up in here, chilling, getting ready for the show. Damn, 20 years ago, that's crazy, man. 20, a lot of legendary things went on, a lot of my idols, a lot of generation of music. Historic, man, Apollo. I wasn't the first. I don't. I don't remember the lineup totally, but you know, just just, just hearing the screams and all that. And when it was my turn to uh, perform, it was just just ball game. Now, mind you, my album's not out, so you know, when I performed, my first song was rather unique. You know, the reception was good. It was fair. Secondly, I did. I didn't give me yours, and then that's when Nas came out. He do the hook, so I seen the crowd kind of get up, and you know, I seen the love. It, it was growing. got to Sugar Hill, it was like a tsunami, because everybody from the front and the back, they rushed, and it threw me back for a minute. It caught me off guard, but the love was immense. It was, it was crazy. It's that log right here. This log been touched so many times, so many people. It's legendary within itself. As an artist, what I took from the experience after the Apollo show was that the bar was raised, and I was able to, to, to to meet that ball. Like now it's time for me to go to the next level and, and do bigger venues and, and now I, I feel like I made it, you know? I got the love from my hometown, you know? It was it was early, the album wasn't even out yet. So the album was coming, I, I was like, okay, we're gonna sell some albums, you know what I'm saying? We're gonna get on tour and that's exactly what happened. Do or Die was released on October 10th, 1995. The album stands alongside of the two biggest historical events of the 20th century, the O.J. Simpson acquittal and the Million Man March. Was it a coincidence? That was a coincidence, man. A week before OJ was acquitted, the day of the Million Man March, my album was released. It just felt like I made history regardless of what, you know what I mean? I just felt like I was a part of history, that, that you know, I was here for a reason. I, I mean, documented in time forever. <laughs> so 1995, the album comes out. The reviews are incredible. I remember our press department calling me hour after hour, we got another one, we got another one. We never thought, well, are we gonna sell 10,000? We gonna sell 500,000, 2 million? We were so proud that he got to make his own record and, 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 and the credible people I cared about, the real writers, the real, today we call them bloggers, they all thought it was great. When I premiered AZ's uh, album, Do or Die, on the radio and stuff, the fans took to it immediately you know, as much as they did Illmatic. There were lots of good records coming out at that, at, at that time in era, so I made sure that this one was specially heard. You know, told people, hey, look, man, trust me, this guy is, is it. And they went with it. When I heard Do or Die, it, it was still it was gutter, you know, which is what we like, especially more money, more murder, more homicide, like that. That's the the stuff that you that you that DJ like me, you know, dig for. For him to have records like you know, give me yours, you know, even records like Oh Happy Jackie, Sugar Hill, um, Mo Money, Mo Murder. It's like it told the stories of what was going on in New York, like what we go through, and it's like it's just painted through you know through lyrics. So it's like if you wasn't from New York, it's like a lot of cats that I know from around the world, they look at AZ like, yo, he's one of the coldest rappers ever. You know, hip hop, you can make a hit and it bang, but it gets to a point where you need a joint that goes beyond just 
that bang, you know, that 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 when a person hear it, it's like, I remember when I was doing this at school, or I remember when I was walking down the street and this joint came on the radio, and that Do or Die album, I knew it was gonna be classic because everybody was like fiending for an AZ album. When he came with Sugar Hill, we knew then that he was able to make huge records that transcended into sound scan billboard million styles, you know what I mean? Like, it's a difference when you're just able to spit and rhyme, but to be able to translate that into Billboard number one, you know, global charts, charting, that's just, that's another, it's another thing. So when he was able to do that, we was like, oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> like, okay. Like, he knew that he knew the game plan and he knew the blueprint and he followed it. To me, Doda was important because it was the link in the chain. I brought a certain sophistication to the table, a certain mindset. So I just added on that whole mystique to the game. I, I, it was needed, it was mandatory. Underrated, something of importance and value that has been underappreciated, undervalued, or minimized. At that time, technology demanded a change in the music industry that labels couldn't support. While his labels folded, AZ didn't. He rerouted himself to independence and stood squarely in his purpose. And although being underrated was a perception, prosperity and respect was his reality. The reason why A's probably underrated is because, you know, especially back then, a lot of artists had a big machine behind them to get them out there and get them out there the right way. The way they pushed them, they pushed them on the single on the Sugar Hill, and so they only really pushed what they wanted A to do and what A needed to do to sell records. Those street records that we all love, because that's those are the records that we cling to, those are the B-side records, those are the records that's not singles that y'all don't hear. Those B-side records that A had was crazy. The rap game has high expectations from all of us, and they want to see us do you know, phenomenal things that just, <laughs> impossible things, it's never enough. They want to see him just go and do things that, you know, he might feel like he's already good. You know, I just feel like he created a lane for himself. The reason why Do or Die is still relevant today, 20 years later, because the revolution will not be televised. So I don't care how much internet you have, when you have real, true substance, it's the, the actual content that pierces you. I think, like, looking at all these years, like, I would say his life, it still like, is exemplifies someone who's been successful, you know, someone who's just left a legacy. What you leave is what people will appreciate. And 20 years down the line, for people to appreciate Do or Die, that's a milestone. It's like, you might not say Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas, and it's like you left AZ off of that Mount Rushmore. When you go back with the internet and it's like you start listening to AZ, you be like, yo, this kid is nice. Like, why isn't he on the Mount Rushmore? 20 years later, the heartbeat of a classic man continues. His inspiration doesn't waver, whether he's performing at a sold out show or he's at home being a son, father, and friend. There's just been plenty of times where, where I would call him and just say, I can't do this anymore. He'd be like, um, ain't where you at, I'm on my way. He has taught me, if it's something you want, if it's something you after, just go for it, because he's still going, and he's still doing it. What he's speaking is the truth, what he's saying is knowledge, and it's what we went through, and it could relate, because it's probably what thousands of people went through, and it's probably what people are still going through today. My hopes for him going forward is that he reaches whatever plateau he has in his heart to reach. I want him to reach the goal that he set for himself. I just want him to be happy. When I think of the evolution of AZ from 1993, 1994, the era of Brooklyn and New York, and I think of now, I'm almost envious and jealous that he's that real, that his integrity is so intact, he's his own man. It's wine. When you drink a great wine, you're, you're, you're drinking it through the soil. You taste the cork, you taste the spice, you taste things through the soil. And the best wine is an amalgamation of all that. So today's big, big records that you're hearing, whatever it is, Kendrick Lamar, there might be something from his parents in there who gave him and played subconsciously a little bit of AZ. Talking about his evolution as a man and a, as an artist, I would say that he was destined to do that. It's very difficult for me to see him any other way. 
He was bred to be a king. AZ's life has always been a delicate dichotomy. He was called man when he was merely a kid. He had a major label deal, but chose independence. He's one of the greatest MCs in the game, but still underrated. But this tender balance never kept him from creating timeless classics that set and raised the standards for hip hop. Today, AZ is experiencing a new golden era in the studio, recording the long awaited Do or Die 2. Dubbing the Do or Die right now, the sequel, I feel no pressure. I just feel good to get through it. Like 20 years later, I'm kind of excited, honestly. For this Do or Die 2, I think those that contribute as far as producers, they understood AZ. So they're bringing the right music to the table, and um, it's enabling me to, to put the flow that, that's missing in the game. What made me reflect you know, from this whole journey is that I'm still on a journey. You know, it's not the ending. It's really like a whole brand new beginning. My mind has opened up more from learning the business, knowing that I perfected my craft, and, and um, I'm looking forward to it.